Universities at Boston College are very important. They provide faculty and students with opportunities to work side by side in a dynamic leading environment, learning environment, and we want our students to graduate with the best sense of the world, and the sciences are critical to that understanding. So today we're going to hear from Professor Michael Naughton. Uh, Professor Naughton is a professor of physics at Boston College. He's the university's interim associate vice president for research. His nanotech research led to the invention of a device that detects buried non-metallic landmines, for which he is now holds a patent. Professor Naughton holds degrees from St. John's Fisher's College and Boston University. He joined the university with tenure after teaching at the State University of New York at Buffalo. He is a winner of the National Science Foundation Award in 1992 and has been named a fellow of the American Physical Society in the Division of Condensed Matter Physics. You will gather that Professor Norton is an acclaimed research scientist. In today's presentation, it will also be apparent to you that he's an enthusiastic and gifted teacher of undergraduates. He'll talk to us about the role of, in the work of undergraduates in the lab and how undergraduates are playing a critical role and advances the frontiers of science. Please join me in welcoming Professor Norton. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. I'm going to, uh, if I can, take my coat off, kind of move around a little bit. So I'm here to talk about science at BC, and in particular, science for your children, and, and opportunities, and, and the, the conditions we try to set up for uh, education and, uh, and research opportunities for students. Let me see if I can get this to work. There we go. Oops. I'll get it down. We call it big science at the nanoscale. And so I, I, whether or not you've heard of nanotechnology, I'll give you a brief introduction to it or, or, or what we mean by nano. But briefly, it's 10 to the minus 9, or a billionth of a meter. And we'll give you some pictures of what that means. But first, the main message I want to convey is, is the answer to the question, why is curiosity-driven basic science good for you, good for us, good for your children? And, and, and that's the starting point we we always use to engage students, graduate level and undergraduate level, in our research. So let me just give you a couple of quick examples. You don't have to bother reading these things, but um, stuff that went on over the last hundred years, like discoveries in quantum physics or the quantum nature of particles or electrons, um, conveyed, uh, combined with completely independently, people needed to count atomic particles, uh, and also there were lots of advances in, in, mag in, in math and logic. This is what led to what we now know as computers. So these are dissimilar uh, developments that led to the development of, of the computer society we live in now. Once you had computers, there was a need to move large amounts of data. These atom smashers were collecting tons of data. They didn't know what to do with it. They had to move it around and get it from one computer to another. And they had to invent a way to do that. And that thing is now known as the World Wide Web. It was discovered or it was invented at, at a research laboratory in Switzerland, in, in, in Europe. Uh, so, in other words, it wasn't necessarily the goal was to create the World Wide Web we know of it today, but it was to do something specific that led to this beautiful unintended consequence. And the third example is people, in their own words, were playing around the lab one day and had some lucky breaks on something they were trying to do, and, and as a result, uh, discovered something completely different that they didn't try to do, and that was the laser. And so, the point here is that <clears throat> If you start with curiosity, you see a problem you're interested in, you don't even know if you're going to get to the end of that problem, but if you're a curious person and you play out on that curiosity, and you have the conditions to do something with it, that is training, you have the facilities, the laboratory to play out your curiosity, and sometimes you get a little lucky, some serendipity, that's very often the direct path towards discovery. It may not be what you were looking for, but what you end up with is what matters. And so that's the conditions we're trying to set up at Boston College, and that's what we always do as scientists is rely on our training and our curious minds and try and get lucky and come up with discoveries. And we now have opportunities in almost all the sciences in everybody's lab for undergraduate students to partake in this pathway towards fun, basically. So now I want to give you some examples of how does this happen and what, of what types of discoveries might be in place to happen at Boston College. But first I want to define what we mean by a university college. And the short story here is that the research we're doing within the sciences is, in our humble opinion, top level at any university in the country. And the resources we're given, you see the beautiful facilities that are around, 
the people that are being attracted to work here, the students that are coming, your children are better and better students, uh, but yet we never lose sight of the fact that we are a college and we want to serve the undergraduate students. And serving them is not just teaching them in coursework, it's bringing them in, into our labs and letting them do this discovery-based science. Um, and by way of example, some numbers, we have close to $20 million in science grants last year. It's about a third of the research money that's coming into Boston College altogether. Okay, a scientist can round up 17 to 20, it sounds better. Uh, we have 500 science and math course sections taught for now on the order of 50,000 credit hours. It's not that many students, but 50,000 credit hours in the sciences alone. So it's not a small presence, it's a significant fraction of the, of the education at Boston College. And this is the undergraduate level edu education. And so we like to think that we combine the best aspects of major research universities, which many of us consider ourselves to be, or if not, we certainly strive to be that, with the very best of undergraduate college, which we think we are among the top undergraduate colleges. And it's the best place to be is at somewhere where they do both. It's the best service to your children as undergraduate students to have the opportunity to work with graduate students and postdocs and faculty right in their labs. So now I want to show a couple of examples of how that's going on here and get back to the title of the talk, which was big science, but at the nano scale. Um, so what does this mean for your children, for BC students? First, there are on the order of, in fact, more than 1,000 undergraduate science majors, which is what percentage? I forgot. It's 10% it's, um, maybe of the undergraduate uh, population is, is a science major. Uh, and back to the university college, we have what we call a unified faculty. That is, the, the same faculty who are teaching graduate courses are also teaching under, undergraduate courses and are also uh, running laboratories or, um, or research uh, activities. So the students study with the faculty who are also active researchers. And that is, those students are in the labs on, alongside those faculty. And finally, I want to point out this in quotes, we call it the 100% research guarantee. As part of the uh, assessment and planning procedure that's going on at Boston College for where will we be in the next 10, even 30 years, um, <clears throat> one of the investments we hope to see is large investments in the sciences to grow on what um, good quality has happened already. And as part of that, we're trying to, uh, we, we may be certainly among the first, maybe even the first university in the nation to guarantee a research opportunity to every undergraduate science major who wants one. So you will, you'll never be left behind, and, and every student will be able to be either in a lab or a research project with a faculty member, and we can guarantee that. And so that's what we're striving to be. And so it underscores the strength of the commitment to the undergraduate student at a graduate university. And now I get to the examples of how students could experience science, big science at the nanoscale, at Boston, at Boston College, at the University of Boston College. Here's an example, I'll give you two examples, one in chemistry, I'm in physics, but I know a little tiny bit of chemistry, but I'm gonna show you a colleague of mine's work, and this is an example of the undergraduate student who is in his lab, and this is work that she, in fact, is working on. Uh, so the, the title is Opportunities for Drug Discovery. And these opportunities have never been greater because of a couple of examples. One is the Human Genome Project. I'm sure you've all heard of it. What this is doing is scads of data is coming out. They're mapping mice and humans and all kinds of uh, mammals and, and non-mammals. So there's large amounts of data. But what are we going to do with that data? And what are the opportunities as a result? One opportunity is this large, enormous increase in the number of disease targets to treat. So improving the human condition and prolonging life, for example. Combined with something called combinatorial chemistry, which increased the rate of compound synthesis and screening, basically you can get a silicon wafer, the same thing they make Pentium chips on, and you can put 10,000 different chemicals on there and test them all at once in some combinatorial manner. So it rapidly increases the rate at which you can analyze chemicals and, and how they work with regard to disease, for example, and screening them. And here's a simple example. On the left top is something you might have taken, your children probably don't take it as much as you and your parents did, aspirin, still a very good thing. Great news, it relieves pain. Not so great news, it upsets the stomach. That was the motivation for pharmaceutical companies to develop something similar. If you look carefully, you know, the chemical compound is not too different from this other one, Tylenol, acetaminophen. 
they modify it in such a way that the same good news is there, pain relief, with more good news, no, it's an upset stomach. So that's the type of thing that, 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 uh, that's being conceived of for uh, beyond pain relief, but um, cancer and, and other disease gratification. So uh, another example is uh, <clears throat> mitomycin C, some other chemical, don't worry about the details there. Good news is it kills cancer cells. Anyway, it has uh, family members or loved ones or, or, or uh, uh, know people that are, uh, have cancer, you know that the bad news is also is that the chemotherapy kills the healthy cells as well as the bad cells, the cancer cells. So our goal is, well, we're not there yet. The goal is to have the top be good news still and the bad and, and more good news like acetaminophen is that it doesn't kill the healthy cells. So the good news is we need a drug that differentiates healthy from cancer cells. We're not there yet. No one is there yet. Lots of people are working on that, including research at Boston College. <clears throat> and so, for example, a specific example of Boston College is this. I won't bother saying the name of this chemical here. Uh, it has some efficacy against uh, cancer cells, but it's an extremely laborious, time-consuming, and expensive process to synthesize that chemical. So the goal and, and the avenue of research in this particular lab is to create something called catalysts that take accessible molecules and chemicals and convert them into the ones that do what we want to do. And that is this as yet right now uh, undiscovered catalyst. But the goal is to be able to get that same endpoint with some simple compound that you can buy. So I'm not going to give you the details of how that's done. It's not been done yet, but they're working towards it. But the point is, the students, undergraduate students, are in the labs that are doing this. In fact, they're the ones that are doing a lot of this work in the lab. You can see sometimes there's a target in there, and you can, and maybe there's some serendipity that'll come along and they'll, and they'll um, make that discovery that will invent this catalyst. Uh, and as you can see, maybe you can't read along the top, but students are performing 100% of the experiments as part of their training. And there's a list of a half a dozen undergraduate students working alongside. 10 or so graduate students, not shown here as postdocs, people who recently got the graduates akin to a, uh, a resident of an MD, in addition to the faculty member as well. So there's large groups of people and undergraduates get to experience just what the graduate students get and learn along the way. On to the second example of a physics laboratory. Uh, a couple of, uh, of students' names, juniors and seniors that are working in this laboratory now and the projects they work on, in fact, the top two, I'll give a little example of what these two students are working on, and that gets to the nano. Even though the previous slides in the chemistry examples indeed did show nano, the size of those molecules were about one nanometer. And so, in fact, chemistry has always been nanotechnology. It's physics that's new to it, and biology. This particular example is advancing nuclear magnetic resonancing, resonance imaging, also known as magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, with nanotechnology. So I'm gonna guess that many of you are familiar with conventional MRI. Hopefully you're not, and you haven't needed to use to do this before, but uh, <clears throat> this is an MRI machine, a whole body where you would slide the body in and would be able to do some imaging in a, in a non-invasive way, not even as damaging as x-rays, and it sees things that x-rays can't. X-rays can see dense matter like bones, they can't see soft matter like muscles. Uh, MRI is just the opposite, it sees the soft matter. So here's for example, a slice, oops, let me go back up. Uh, what's called a slice of a brain image. Basically, MRI can image uh, non invasively what's in your body and take an individual slice one at a time and take a picture of what's in there. Then they can put those pictures back together and get a three dimensional image. And the experts in this know how to look at the contours. So this is the top of the head, the nose, and the, maybe you can't see that dot. The eyes here, the nose, and the uh, central cortex and the brain in the skull around the outside. And the experts can look at this and see differences in color and, and, and pinpoint a tumor, for example. Uh, so it's good for identifying problems. Uh, <clears throat> this is the state of the art right now. And, and the state of the art might be defined as the size or the resolution. How accurately can you see this little picture here? How, how fine a feature can you see? And, and uh, right now, what's done with the state of the art is you can diagnose. You can find things. You can't really cure with MRI. And just find what the problem is and use some other chemical means or otherwise secure it. What we're working on now is overcoming certain limits of that technology. Those limits are this resolution I talked about. In addition to the resolution of how fine a feature can you see, 
is limited by our ability to sit inside a strong magnetic field. Eventually, it bothers the cells in the, in the body. And so it's resolution limited by the, so there's a very strong magnetic field is the key point here. So that's an analytical problem. Also, MRI takes snapshots like that picture of the slice of the brain. It's a still picture. There's no movies. Don't have the ability to see what happens in time. Uh, say, as you treat with a chemical or, or, or a drug and see how the brain reacts dynamically. And it's also not in vivo. That's the, the, the uh, magnet is all outside of the body. There's no, no fine-tuned view from inside. So based on our purely fundamental research of looking at magnetism in materials, we're now able to project ahead and say, what if we could do this on a smaller scale? And what if we could do this MRI type thing uh, in a completely different way? And by example, I show here. On the upper right, we say we're working on advancing this MRI using something called carbon nanotube technology. So I have to show you what I mean by carbon nanotube. But briefly, uh, 20 years ago, there were two forms of carbon. There was diamond and there was graphite. The graphite in your pencils and the diamond on your fingers. Now there's many other forms, but mostly this is tubular form of, of carbon called carbon nanotubes. And they literally form tubes of chicken wire that are exceedingly small. And you'll see pictures of them in a few minutes. But using those and other nano-sized things like that, uh, there's the potential that's shown in the bottom left for not just seeing the slice of the brain, obviously the side of the head here and the nose and the eyes, uh, not just seeing a still picture of, of, I mean, it's a fabulous advancement that we can see this now, but we can dream about seeing things 10 million times better using nanotechnology. And therefore, single molecule, not just single slice of a, of a whole brain, identification, for example, for disease diagnostics and treatment, or even for Intel to look at individual defects on their Pentium 27 wafer uh, for the you know, 10 generations later of, of computer chips um, <coughs> to, uh, to advance the clocks of uh, computers. So in other words, the dream is something like this. From the muscle to the cells that make up the muscle, to even the proteins in the cells, to even the DNA in the proteins, to even the atoms that make up the DNA in the protein in the cell, in the muscle, in the brain. That's the rather realistic goal of advancing MRI as an imaging, basically a microscope technique to be able to, uh, by using nanotechnology. And this is what we're doing in our labs, and this is what undergraduate students are taking part in growing the nanotubes, assembling them on silicon wafers, and, uh, and putting them in magnetic fields and using them to do NMR, or magnetic resonance imaging. And so, again, the idea, sort of the motivation, we may not get there for some time, you never know, we probably have to get lucky, some serendipitous discoveries, but to be able to say, okay, now we can image this, this is a cartoon of DNA, no one has ever gotten a real image of DNA like this. We hope to be able to someday. And, and one could look at the GCAT or the base pairs and say, aha, look at this one here. That's rotating 10 degrees the wrong way. That's why you have this disease. And we can turn to chemists and they can say, oh, I can design a molecule that can go in and rotate that back. I don't know if that might happen, but you have to have some sort of a vision. And students in the labs can come up with these visions on their own if they're in the conditions working with the training and the curiosity. If they have their own curiosity, we encourage the curiosity to come out. And so now, how are we going to try and do it? I'm not going to have time to give you the details, but this is a couple of carbon nanotubes. And these are little uh, tubes made of purely carbon that are literally 10, maybe even maybe 100 times, 100,000 times smaller than human hair. So that's the figure of merit. You pluck out a hair, and it's a tenth of a millimeter wide. I found that Asian hair is 20% thicker. People have done this by measuring them for some reason. I don't know why. <clears throat> but imagine the thickness of a diameter of a human hair, and this is at least 10,000 times smaller. And we can make these individually and put them where we want them. We're not the only ones. Other people can as well. So what you do with them once you can make them. Um, and these, in, in this case here, they're sitting on gold wires, which are only, you know, only 1,000 or only 5,000 times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. They're still exceedingly small. Uh, by the way, the DNA of the previous picture is only about a fourth as small as this thing. So these are basically tools to probe biomolecules like DNA and individual cells that are the same size as the DNA, 
rather than tools that are millions in, in, or so um, larger. So that's an example of a carbon nanotube. We're going to be having these with little magnets stuck on the end. You can almost see one of the little light spot on the end is actually a little nano magnet that will actuate it and move it in a magnetic field, and that's the manner in which we approach to do MRI. Uh, just a little bit more elaboration on that. Something unique to Boston College is we have those types of structures. That's sorry. That's two of them there. We can make individual ones. By the way, they're not green in real life. They're probably black. Uh, <clears throat> as divining rods. So you may or may not know what a divining rod is some completely mythical, useless thing that people would hold and find water or talk to ghosts in closets or whatnot. But um, <clears throat> the, 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 the name got conjured up because we have real nanostructures, carbon nanotube-based things that we can now make that are in this geometry, as shown in the next slide. So that's one oriented a different way, but a Y-shaped device that can be made um, very precisely now. And this little scale bar is uh, one micrometer, one millionth of a meter. And so a human hair is the width of this building, the diameter of human hair compared to that there. So we can put thousands of these around the diameter of human hair if you ever want to. There's no reason to want to, but just to put the scale down. Uh, so what we're doing is we're actually attaching wires to these things and hanging them out and make them move around and put magnets on the end. And we can use that to image, to scan little things like cells and, and even, um, even biomolecules like DNA. And so we're using carbon nanotubes of, of this size that, that students themselves can grow. It's amazingly simple to grow once you learn the process. You can almost do it in a microwave oven. Uh, and now we have these special ones. We have the conditions, perfected the conditions for growing these basically world unique types of divining rod nanotubes. And we're now using these to try and develop tools to do this MRI for that zoom in from the brain to the to the cell, to the protein, to the DNA, to the atom. I, I could not not show this little picture. So this is actually a video of one individual divining rod nanotube. So you see the three branches here. And it's, it's, it's attached to a, 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 a sub surface over there, a metal surface. We have a little tiny gold wire coming in. We've attached to it. That little thing there is 100 nanometers. So this is only about. Um, a couple of hundred atoms across. You can see it's hollow, the little thing in the middle, so it's a tube of carbon. And we're able to run electricity through this and measure its electrical properties while moving it around. Uh, and this is a simulation. It's actually real data. It's a real one. But this is the type of thing we want to do in the end to use this as a probe, as a microscopic probe of magnetism. And that's the manner in which you do MRI. And so this facility is world unique. There's nowhere else where you can put this all together with a structure that small and put, put active electrodes on it and move it around like this and measure it. And that's over in Higgins Hall at the top of the hill above uh, County Forum. And indeed, undergraduate students are sitting there turning the knobs and making this thing move and running current through them alongside graduate students and faculty. Finally, I want to make a comment, a few comments about uh, science at Boston College, the growth of science as exemplified in this case by the physics, my own physics department. Boston College's first Rhodes Scholar was last year, shown here, Paul Taylor. Uh, <clears throat> actually, we had two that year, but minutes before the non-physics one, the physics one was named a Rhodes Scholar, so he's the first. Uh, <clears throat> not quite sure about that, actually. But, uh, so we have Rhodes Scholars, Goldwater Scholars, Marshall, Fulbright, Beckman, Truman, National Science Foundation Fellows, and many, many more fellows, women and men, uh, who are, who are achieving recognition through, through their research and their uh, uh, classwork at Boston College. And another example of the growth of the sciences, final example here is um, over the last eight or 10 years, you can see that the number of majors has more than tripled the number of majors in the physics department. Albeit we started with a small number on the order of a couple of tens, but now we're approaching 100. And this uh, exemplifies the growth of the sciences, not just physics, but physics, chemistry, uh, biology, geology, geophysics, computer science, everything. So it, it's sort of a new thing for Boston College. And if any of you are alumni or alumnae, you might not have known that Boston College was uh, prominent in any way in science, but we'd like to think that it's becoming more and more so in a very competitive way. And that's just good for the undergraduate students because they're partaking in this as it's happening and even making it happen as well. And so 
The moral of the story, if you don't remember anything else from this, from this talk, is that the number of BC physics majors is rising, and being scientists, we like to extrapolate. And so if we do extrapolate that, then in 2035, everybody here will be a physics major. And so I can't wait for that day. Thank you. It was a perfect There's talk. Right There's no questions. I have a question. I have one question. I understand there is a limited number of institutions doing this work. How many such institutions? Which work now? I mean, there's different things that, on the nanotube. So the question was, do you understand there's a limited number of institutions doing the work on nanotubes? Uh, it's growing over time uh, because, number one, you can publish how these are made and other people can learn from it. And that's a great thing because there's an awful lot of work to be done. Uh, and so I think probably every university in the country is doing work in some way or another on nanotechnology. But there's niches and there's, there's uh, specialties that you can have at each university. We don't have the best of everything, but we do have the best of some of the things we do. And so um, nanotechnology is uh, nanotechnology is hard to define now. There was, there was a, those might remember several decades ago, the Supreme Court was asked to define some term, and I won't say what it was, but they said, I, I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. Um, nanotechnology is similar to that. It's, it's, bio, it's biology now. It's, it's physicists doing biology, and it's chemists doing electrical engineering, and it's all a hybridization of the sciences, which is a fabulous thing. But a lot of it is driven by nanotechnology, is being able to assemble things molecule by molecule or atom by atom and build structures like those nanotubes or those divining rod nanotubes. The divining rod stuff is unique to BC, and, and the ability to manipulate them, like you saw, is unique to Boston College. Is this technology mostly applicable to health? Or the question is is this technology mostly applicable to health? Um, No, I think the short answer is no, it's applicable to, to everything, to, to, uh, to electronics, to, to, um, to um, well, health is, there's many different ways to talk about health. There's curing of diseases, there's assisting the blind to see and the deaf to hear, that's still health. Nanotechnology is making ro main roads there. Artificial cochlear implants that, that replicate the hairs inside your ear, that, they're about the same size as those nanotubes. So people are using them for health in that respect. But that's pure electrical and acoustic engineering that's being applied to health. But it's also being applied, say, by the military for, for sensing and listening <laughs> devices. So they have applications everywhere, including health. It's all yes. driven by curiosity. Yeah, whatever you can think of, you can, you can think about doing. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I think the job market is going to explode for physics majors, especially physics majors who take an interest in the other sciences and in and, and, and an integrated approach. So we like to use the phrase integrated science. And more and more, pharma companies are looking for physicists to come do biology to do from a physics point of view because of the quantitative aspects and quantitative parts of training that is inherent in physics that is starting to be developed in biology. But uh, we're seeing our students now go um, to places like pharma. So I, I think, maybe optimistically, but I think that um, the job market for, for physicists is going to be very different in the next 10 years than it's ever been before. Next question here. Is the research all government funded or do you have collaborations with some private? <coughs> the research, the question was where, who funds the research? Um, what you saw in the nanotube was funded in part by the National Science Foundation, by the Department of Energy, by DARPA, the Department of Advanced Research Projects Agency, basically the, uh, <coughs> the succeed, succeeding of ARPA who invented the internet. Um, but it's also a, many collaborations with other universities as well on, on different parts. Um, and there are some money, but not enough, from private foundations. That's something we'd like to see more of. And, and I think 
the chemistry and biological fields lend themselves more readily to uh, corporations coming in, like pharmacology companies coming in. But um, you're starting to see that in physics as well. Question. Do you have yeah. anything going in high energy physics at all? As a matter of fact, no. Okay. no. And the reason is this. Boston College is only going to be so large a university. We're not going to compete with MIT in everything and in Harvard, etc. And so for physics, we are decidedly non-comprehensive. If someone comes and says, I want to get a PhD in astrophysics, we say, that's a great idea. There's many universities you can go to, some, including some across the river. But we, we decided to focus on what was said in the introduction to the called condensed matter physics, which is the hugest part of physics. It's all of all of the biological part, it's, it's all the electrical part, it's all the magnetic part, it's all the mechanical part, but it's not high energy and it's not astrophysics. Questions yet? Um, Cut me off any time. Yes. Your MRI scan. The idea of using the carbon nanotube is to then <coughs> put it into a chemical that you could then instill into the brain and then scan it and then video it. Um, uh, you want me to take that one? <laughs> I miss it. I miss it. <laughs> Good. I was asking you why you answered that. <laughs> okay, you're asking for the detail of how it's going to work a little bit. Let me just tell you that uh, MRI is, is looking at the magnetism in your body. And so this nanoscale MRI is also going to look at the magnetism of whatever we put it near, whether it's something biological or whether it's the Intel chip looking for a silicon, uh, looking for a phosphorus atom in a sea of silicon. You can still find it. And so the way to do it is we'll put a, there'll be a small um, ferrous nickel or some, some magnetic material at the end of it. And we'll wiggle the thing. And it'll wiggle it like a, like a diving board. You can go diving off a diving board and it wiggles at a characteristic frequency, the resonant frequency. These things do that too, and they do it at hundreds of millions of hertz. And so their radio frequency level. And so we'll look for the shift in the resonant frequency as it approaches a magnetic species. And, the, and because it's so small, it'll have the resolution of individual atoms, individual nuclei, actually. And therefore, if you embed it and you can find and you can create some way to actuate it and move it around, it'll simply seal the magnetism all around it. And they're so small, you could probably take a pill with 100,000 of them and have each one at a different frequency and have some computer reading them all at once and you just see everything all at once. I mean, that's a dream, but. And it'll never happen if you don't dream it. So the short answer is it's the same as MRI in, in principle, but done on a very different scale. Questions? That's what he would have said, too. I would have said almost. <laughs> said. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, we're growing the intellectual property office that now that I'm not just in physics, I'm interim vice president for research, they report to me and I'm trying to get more money put into them to get more uh, invention disclosures put out. But in fact, what you showed there was recently patented by Boston College. The concept of the um, dividing rod nanotube for MRI is patented and owned by Boston College. And we're seeking marketing um, and investment from IBM now. Any other questions for Professor Nahum? Professor, thank you very much. You're welcome.